sermon today by asking you a question. Are you saved? Now for some, when I ask that question, you get all excited. Maybe you answer with, with an enthusiastic yes. For many of us, that is the religious question. But for others, that question may be a, a trigger phrase. The moment you hear that question asked, well, you, you, you tense up, you brace yourself. But here it comes, another aggressive evangelist, one of God's salesmen, meddling heaven. Somewhere in America right now, there's a guy with a bullhorn shouting on a street corner, Are you saved? In another town, a housewife opens up a door and finds two guys wearing a shirt and a tie. She cracks the street door to see what's the matter. One of them asks, Are you saved? The other one hands her a religious track, a step by step manual for, for getting right with God. Somewhere in another part of the world, two missionaries just gave each other a high five. The house they just left, two people got saved. Never mind the fact that they got saved last week, uh, last week when the, the mission from down the street came by. The simple fact is they needed another loaf of bread this week too. For years, evangelical churches have been asking the same question. It's a pass or, or, or fail test. There's, there's only one right answer. You're either saved or you're not. And if you're not saved, then here's how we do it. Romans 10, 9 says, If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Now the evangelicals have it right that salvation begins with a confession. A confession that Jesus is Lord. And that confession that Jesus is Lord, it's, it's always been the, the required mark of entry for the church. Our saving relationship with God begins with our confession. A saving word, professing faith in a saving God. It's biblical. It's by our, our, our confession of faith that we are saved by God. However, evangelicals with their, their, their litmus test question, well, in some ways they, they've distorted the gospel by making this confession the, the, the end-all goal rather than the beginning of a journey. Our confession is not the, the end, it's just the beginning. Our confession of Christ, when I think about it, it can be compared to wedding vows. By our confession, we are saved, and by our wedding vows, we are, are married, right? If you have spoken those words, if you have, have spoken those vows in the presence of, of witnesses, in the, in the presence of family and friends, well, then you're, you're married. If you've said the words, I do, then, then it's done. But is that all there is to marriage? Making a, a, a verbal commitment just one time in your life and then going on about your business? <clears throat> a bride and groom stand uh, at the altar and they exchange those traditional vows. The preacher turns to the groom and says, Do you take this bride to be your lawfully wedded wife? The man says, I do. Now imagine with me. Imagine if the groom then uh, left his bride there at the altar and walked right on out the doors of the church. Imagine if he, he gets into his car and he just drives away, leaves, leaves his, his new wife right there at the altar. He drives away, he drives home. The next morning he gets up and he goes to work just like it's any other day. He acts just like nothing's happened. On his lunch break he sits around eating a ham sandwich all by himself. He just goes about his usual routine. Nothing has changed. <coughs> Oh, sometime next week, or maybe the week after, he, he returns to church to see if his bride is still waiting for him at the altar, right where he left. Now, if he's really faithful, uh, he might come several times throughout the year to that very same spot to make sure that his wife is still there. But he never takes her home. He never makes a, a, a life together with her. He doesn't share his life with her. Would you say that this guy is married? No, of course not. But, but he said, I do. He said the right words. Doesn't that mean that he's legally married? He said those words. He made the commitment. So we'd say he's married, but, but of course not. It's ridiculous. That's just, that's just crazy. Because nobody would ever do that, right? Nobody would ever do that to their wife. And yet we do the same thing to God, don't we? People do it to God all the time. 
Are you saved? Yeah, I said those words when I was a child. I made the confession. There was a ceremony and everything. I got baptized in front of my family and friends. There were witnesses. But did you take God home with you? Did, did your confession lead to a, a lifelong relationship with God? Did it change anything at all? Or did you lead God right, where, right there at the same altar where you found Him? Are you saved, the evangelicals ask. And many of us respond, yes, of course I am. And we have become so confident in our decision that we put it out of our mind. Then they've done that. Too often, we're, we're like the, the bridesmaids that, that Jesus told us about, who, who show up uh, with, with their lamps, but didn't bring any oil for the journey. Yeah, I, I'm saved. Here's my lamp to prove it. But where is the light? Now, we all tell jokes about what it's going to be like when we get up to heaven. Usually, they involve St. Peter standing at the pearly gates. And usually, St. Peter has some sort of question for us. And depending on how you answer that question, it makes a difference on whether or not you get in or not. Is that what you think that it's going to be like? Is that what it's going to be like when we get up to heaven? Is there, is there going to be a test? Will there be a, a pop quiz? And if so, what sort of question will, will be asked? Will it be, are you saved? According to the lectionary, today is not just any Sunday. Today is Christ the King Sunday. It's the last Sunday of the, the lectionary cycle before we start a new lectionary cycle next Sunday with the first Sunday in Advent. Starting next Sunday, we're going to be focusing on, on the Advent of Christ, on Christ entering the world that we celebrate on Christmas morning. But as for today, as for today, we, we, we focus on how it's all going to end. When it, all, when it all ends, Jesus is going to be there. And Jesus is going to be King. Christ the King Sunday acknowledges that at the end of our life, we're going to face judgment. And that Jesus is going to be the King and Judge. He's going to be the one who separates uh, and sorts out uh, everybody. The, the religious from the non-religious. The righteous from the unrighteous. The weeds from the wheat. The sheep from the goats. This Sunday calls us to think about that. Think about what it's going to be like. Think about that inevitable day when we will stand at the gates of heaven. And it's not a, a trick question by St. Peter that we need to worry about. Not Peter or any other disciple or any saint in church history will decide your fate. None other than Jesus Christ will be standing at that doorway. And how does Scripture describe what that day is going to be like? What questions will be asked? What criteria would Jesus use to divide us? <clears throat> when we listen to how Matthew tells it, we may be surprised. Listen to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 25, verses 31 through 46. When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, He will sit on His throne in heavenly glory. And the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate the people one from another, as a shepherd separ separates the sheep from the goats. He will put the sheep on his right and the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, take your inheritance, the kingdom prepared for you since the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came and visited me. Then the righteous will answer, Lord, when did we see you, you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see you a stranger and invite you in, or thirsty, or needing clothes? When did we see you needing clothes and clothe you? When did we see you sick? Or in prison and go to visit you. The king will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did for the least of one of these brothers of mine, you did for me. Then the king will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you who are cursed, into eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me nothing to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger. Not invite me in. 
I needed clothes and you did not clothe me. I was sick and in prison and you did not look after me. They will also answer, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or needing clothes or sick or in prison and did not help you? He will reply, I tell you the truth, whatever you did not do for one of the least of these, you did not do for me. Then they will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. This is a powerful story. It's an image that, that drives a lot of Christians. It's one of the fa favorite passages of the Cooperative Baptist Fellowship as they go out to be the presence of Christ in, in this broken world. But the striking thing about, about this story to me is that in both groups, both the sheep and the goats, they were both surprised to discover their status in judgment. Now I think if Jesus had looked at this crowd and asked, are you saved? I think we would have heard voices on either side. There, there would have been people on either side of the fence that would have been giving an affirmative yes. Of course we are. And I think on the other side, you would have had people that they had unsure faces. They, they were eagerly awaiting the judgment of God. It would seem, it would seem from this passage that our admittance is not based on our confession alone, but that there's more to the story. That it's not just enough that we say, I do. There's something about, uh, about how, how we, we treat our spouse. There's, there's something about the marital life that matters. See, being the bride of Christ is not just about repeating sacred vows. It involves sharing your life together. It involves living, living the life that God calls us to live. It's about an ongoing relationship. Being the bride of Christ is not just about words alone. It involves our deeds, our works as well. Now, when I say the word deeds or works, another half of this room may cringe. For too long, Protestants have been allergic to deeds and works because, well, the Protestant faith has always rejected anything that looked like works righteousness. Works righteousness, you know, salvation based on, on something that we do rather than something that, that God does for us. We are saved by faith and not works. I'll say that from the beginning. We are saved by faith. We are saved through the grace that came through Jesus Christ. But in our fear of works righteousness, we have made an artificial separation between word and works. In our fear of works, works righteousness, we have separated our walk from our salvation. In fear of works righteousness, we've separated our wedding vows from our marriage. But James reminds us that faith without works is what? Dead. James chapter 2 puts it bluntly. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith but has no deeds. Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or a sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of you says to them, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical need, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by action, is dead. So obviously, salvation it's not just about the confession that we make on Sunday morning. It has something to do with, the, with how we treat people Monday through Saturday as well. Being a Christian, it changes who we are. It should change who we are and, and, and how we treat people. It, it, it affects what we should be doing. We're supposed to be, to be feeding and visiting. We're supposed to be out there, there healing and visiting the sick, encouraging them. Offering the thirsty a drink. These, these are the practical ways that, that, we, that we work out our salvation. These are the ways that we live into the grace that, that saves us. Being a Christian means doing something. Maybe it means visiting local prisoners just to give them a simple red box that says, I love you. Being a Christian is about doing something. Now, by all means, this is not a works righteousness. Works righteousness means making a calculated effort to do, to do good deeds in order to gain something out of it. Now, a lot of us do that. A lot of us do nice things because we want to impress somebody or get something out of it. That's not what we're talking about here. And works righteousness, it misunderstands uh, grace. 
It, it tries to, to cancel out sin with acts of kindness. That's not what we're talking about here either. That's not Christianity. That's, that's karma. That's the balance of, uh, of yin and yang. And we can be certain that, that it doesn't work that way because in no way are the sheep in this story, in no way are they presented as making any calculated effort. On the contrary, they were clueless. They had no idea that they were doing anything extra special at all. They were feeding and visiting. They were doing all those things. They were clothing and caring for the poor and the marginalized just because it's what you do. They were doing those things because it's who they are. And they wouldn't dream uh, of being any other way. The sheep, those, those who, 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 who were on Jesus' right, they had been transformed by the Spirit. Transformed by the Spirit of the living God. Those sheep, they, they traded in the desires for the flesh, for God's desire for, for this world. For God's vision of what this world should be like. They weren't trying to earn their salvation. They were responding to God's call for salvation for the world. Now, on the contrary, those, those who made calculated efforts to save themselves by works, well, they probably find themselves on the side of the goats. Jesus, what do you mean? Uh, when, you know, when did we, we see you, you naked and not offer you clothes? What do you mean? When did we, when did we not visit you? We thought we did everything that you asked us to do. Didn't we visit you every time we came to church? Didn't we visit you every time we, we came here on Sunday? Oh, well, what about my perfect attendance pin from 1992? Doesn't that mean anything? We even gave money to the church. We thought we did all that was required of us. Being a Christian requires that we look at the world differently. And Jesus here has given us a powerful insight. Jesus here has given us the secrets to the kingdom of God. Jesus has explained. He's explained the, the greatest commandments. To love God and to love neighbor. He's explaining exactly what they look like. And, and now, now Jesus, he paints us this picture. He paints us this picture that our love for God is intimately tied in with our love for neighbor. So much so that, that God is present in our neighbor's face. God is in the eyes of the stranger that we welcome. God is in the face of the hungry child that we feed. God can be found uh, among those who need, need hope, such as the sick, the dying, or the imprisoned. And if you want to have a good marriage, then you have to do things for your spouse. You have to do things with your spouse. If you want to have a good relationship with God, then you have to serve the Lord with gladness. And Jesus paints a clear picture of what that looks like. The way we serve the Lord. We serve the Lord by doing for the least of these among my brethren. Jesus, He sought us out. He sought us out when we were lowly, when we were weak, when we were poor. Jesus sought us out when we were poor sinners. We return the favor by seeking Jesus out among the lowly, among the wretched, among the poor. We seek Jesus out when we seek out the lost. When we welcome the stranger in our midst. When we welcome that stranger into our presence, it's like welcoming Jesus Christ into this church. I heard a story told the other day about a man who was just walking down the street minding his own business. He had to walk by an alley. And he looked down and he saw a man lying down in that alley. He was afraid he might be hurt. So like the, you know, like the good Samaritan, he goes over to this man. He kneels down and he looks at him. He sees that the guy is indeed injured. That he's bruised. That he's beaten. That he's bleeding. He was mugged by a gang and left there for dead. Now the man did what, what I hope most of us would have done. He whipped out his cell phone and he immediately called 911. And then despite all the questions that the police were sure to ask him, he stayed there with him. He could just barely see his, the man's chest rising and falling as, as he waited for the ambulance to show up. Then for a moment, the, the man's eyelids <coughs> began to, to open just a little bit. You heard him try to gurgle something and and then he goes back off into unconsciousness. When the ambulance came and picked the man up, got him to the hospital. 
About a week later, the guy was out of the hospital and back on his feet again, and he tracked down his good Samaritan. He wanted to thank him, to thank him for saving his life. And he found a man at work. So he went to his office. He introduced himself. He said, hey, remember me? How could I forget, the man said. Well, I just wanted to come by and say thank you for saving my life. I was lying there, drifting in and out of consciousness. I was sure that I was going to die. And then, then for a split second, I opened my eyes to discover a figure hovering above me. I thought that that was it. Because I, I, I swear to you, when I looked up at your face, I thought it was the face of Jesus Christ. That man was shocked. He, he, he didn't think that he'd done anything extra special. He couldn't, have, he couldn't imagine reacting any other way to that situation. He was a very humble man. And this whole display of thanksgiving, well, it was making him rather uncomfortable. After thinking for a minute, he looked the man dead in the eyes. And he said, no, sir, you've got it all wrong. When I saw you lying there, me broken, bruised and bleeding, I thought to myself that you must be Jesus. For he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was upon him. By his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Let us pray. Lord, we offer you all the thanksgiving and praise this morning for coming into this world, for coming into our life, for walking beside the people that you want to save, for seeking out the lost wherever they may be found, for setting us the, the example of what it means to, to live for you. You went into this world healing and, and feeding, meeting physical needs, and directing people to your kingdom. And as we come to Christ, as we come to you, it's not just about what's in it for us. It's about accepting a calling on our life. A calling to imitate you. A calling to imitate you and your mission for reaching out to this broken world. Lord, as we celebrate Thanksgiving this week, as we think about all the many ways that we are blessed, <coughs> may we take seriously this calling and share with those less fortunate. May we seek your face daily in those who, who are hurting all around us, those who need encouragement, those who need hope. <coughs> May we, we strengthen our relationship with you as we serve our neighbors. May we demonstrate our love for you as we love our neighbors. These things we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our most precious Savior. Amen. Amen.